In session three, we had a brief overview of quantitative research design and also discussed important components of your research design, including sampling and data collection methods with a focus on questionnaire. In the next two presentations, we will touch on another essential part of your methods section. That is how you will analyze the collected data and report those results if you are conducting a quantitative study. Quantitative research collects and documents data in a numerical format. Then the next step is to analyze the data using statistical analysis. There are two types of statistical analysis, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics summarize information that is contained in your sample. On the other hand, inferential statistics is drawing conclusions about your population from your sample. As we discussed previously, we get our sample because we cannot observe the entire population. Then how do we draw a conclusion about population from our sample? Using some statistical calculation, we test to what extent the information obtained from our sample is the reflection of your population of interests. Depending on what you want to accomplish from your study, you will describe the major attributes of your sample in your results. Or you will analyze your data employing some type of inferential statistics to make conclusions about the population. Another dimension that you should consider is the number of variables that you have to include in your analysis. For example, if your research question is to understand the nature of one dimension, such as the level of overall student satisfaction with the professional development program, then you have only one variable to analyze. In this case, it will be a univariate statistics that you will estimate. On the other hand, if your research question focuses on the relationship between two factors, you will need to estimate a bivariate statistics. Let's assume that your research question is to explain the association between students' participation in a professional development program and job attainment at ASU's higher education master's program. Then you have two variables here, student participation and job attainment. You will employ one of the bivariate statistics to answer your research question, and we will explore more of these details soon. Finally, your research question might address relationships among variables. Let's say that you will be still looking at what factors influence students' job attainment, but now consider not only their participation in professional development, but also their academic performance, occupational aspirations, and some other background information such as gender, race, ethnicity, and age. In this case, you will be analyzing relationships among multiple variables and therefore employ a multivariate analysis. Most of the time, descriptive statistics are univariate or bivariate statistics. However, you can also compare the summarized information about the sample against your population. Meanwhile, multivariate statistics are most of the time inferential statistics. Now, let's look at what information is described and reported for each of those analyses. First, univariate statistics summarize characteristics of one variable. So univariate statistics reserve questions that try to capture the nature of one dimension. For example, you can capture a student's level of satisfaction. We can also explain the frequency of an event or the degree in which things happen using univariate statistics. Again, univariate statistics describe the characteristics of one variable. Depending on the level of measurement of your variable of interest, you will analyze and report different statistics. First, if your variable of interest is either interval or ratio variable, i.e. a continuous variable, you will need to report measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion. Basically, in a quant study, a variable is consistent of different values taken by each observation. To describe the nature of this variable, 
you explain a single value that best represents the values appear in that variable. Then you also explain how spread out are the variables of a given variable. On the other hand, if your variable of interest is a categorical variable, so if the variable takes two values or limited numbers of categories, you will report frequency distributions. This is basically analyzing the frequency of values for each values existing in a given variable. I'll try to explain each of them with some examples, so hopefully you will understand them more clearly. Okay, if you're describing the trend in one variable, you will first describe measures of central tendency. Again, those measures are to show what value is the most representative of that particular variable. First measure is the mean. Very straightforward, mean represents the arithmetic average of a variable. So if we had a data that documented math scores of five students, then we will calculate the mean and say that the average of five people, which is 82 in this example, best represents the test score of our sample. Median, on the other hand, is the center point of the values. Basically, the values in the data will be put in ascending or descending order. Then the number that comes to the middle point will be identified. In the example of the math scores, we find that 85 is the score that is in the middle point among the scores appeared in our data. FYI, when we have odd numbers of observations, the middle point is calculated as the average of the two points that comes to the middle. Finally, you can use the most frequently occurring number to represent the variable. This is referred as mode. You can report all mean, median, and mode when you summarize a variable. And in fact, it is actually beneficial to report all the statistics. Why? Although mean is an often used statistics to describe the centrality of a variable, mean does not necessarily indicate the actual trend in the data. For example, this graph is capturing the household income since 1976. If you see the mean income for 2000 and 2012, it was about $75,000 and $71,000 respectively. However, this average might be inflated by the households that earned very high income. How do we know that? Because the median income was a lot lower than the average numbers. The median income, the middle point of the values presented across all households captured in the data for 2000 and 2012 was $56,000 and $51,000 respectively. This graph shows the reported full-time salaries for low school graduates of 2012. Although the mean was found to be 80,000, you see that a bunch of people make about 45,000, while a small number of people make about 165,000, and this number is increasing the mean. So knowing that there are two data points or values that have most observations, i.e. two modal points, will be helpful to better explain the trends in the annual salary of law school graduates. Once you describe the measures of centrality, you will also need to explain how dispersed values are in the variable. First, you can report maximum and minimum values appeared in the variable. Range is simply the differences between the minimum and maximum values. While this provides some useful information about the variation in the variable, it is not very informative because sometimes the smallest or largest values might be outliers. For example, let's take the household income distribution as an example. If we were to describe the distribution using the range, it might range from zero to household income of people like Mark Zuckerberg, that might be some billions. Obviously, this extreme value is influencing the range of the values represented in this variable. Because range is influenced by extreme data values, we can use other measures including interquartile range. 
Because range is influenced by extreme data values, we can use other measures including interquartile range. Basically, interquartile range uses range of values of the variable represented by the middle 50% of observations. What does that mean? First, you will break up the data range into four quarters. The interval from the first quartile to the third quartile then contains the middle 50% of the data. The interquartile range is defined to be the length of this interval. So in this case, the third quartile value is 90,000 and the first quartile value is 25,000 and therefore the interquartile range will be 65,000. Another often used statistics to describe the dispersion of a variable is standard deviation and variance. We are definitely not going to go over the equations here, but the basic idea is that standard deviation captures the average difference of the observed variables of the variable from the mean. Variance is a byproduct of calculating the standard deviation, but just remember that variance captures how on average each value deviates from the mean. Knowing a standard deviation is very helpful to really understand the nature of the variable. For example, let's say that University A has information on SAT composite score for different entering courts. To understand the academic achievement of each court, a person analyzes the mean, a measure of centrality, and standard deviation, a measure of dispersion. Now you see that all incoming cohort had same average academic achievement defined as SAT scores. However, the standard deviation suggests that each cohort might have different range of students in the group. The 2007 cohort had standard deviation of 300. This means that the average difference of students' SAT score from the mean was 300. On the other hand, the 2013 cohort had a standard deviation of 100. Again, this means that on average, students' score is 100 point different from the average SAT score of the cohort. What do the standard deviations suggest then? Yes. At University A, the overall average SAT score has remained the same for the three courts, but the incoming court has been more homogeneous in their academic achievement over time between 2007 and 2013. The other reason the standard deviation is useful is because of the 68-95-1990.7 rule. Basically, when the distribution of a variable is symmetric, like the one we see on this slide, 60% of the observation falls into plus minus one standard deviation. 95% of the observation is within the range of two standard deviations, and 1990.7% of the observations are within the three standard deviations. Another thing that you have to look at when you judge the dispersion or variation of a variable is the shape of the distribution. In most of the cases, you will expect the symmetrical distribution where mean, median, and mode are the same. When the three measures are different, you will describe that the variable is skewed. When the median is bigger than the mean, then the shape of the distribution is going to have a longer tail to the right. We say this is positively skewed distribution. On the other hand, if your variable has a smaller mean compared to the median value, then the distribution is having a longer tail to the left side and the distribution is negatively skewed. So if you have to describe the shape of the distribution for the household income, how do you explain this? Yes, it is positively skewed because the right tail is longer and the mass of the distribution is concentrated on the left of the figure. You will also can tell that the mean household income will be bigger than the median value of the income. Okay, so far we went over the statistics that we have to report if we are describing a variable that takes a continuous value. Now, what if your variable only has two values or numbers of categories? 
the newly report frequency distributions. Basically, frequency distribution is the count number of respondents of each value. For example, you may collect information concerning how much time students spend studying for an exam. Note that you only gave them options of 0 to 10 or more. The total number tallied in each category by the researcher then will be recorded as the frequency. Depending on your interest, you can collapse the values into a small set of values. For example, if you're interested in only discerning students who studied 5 or more hours versus less than 5 hours, you can collapse the frequency in the respective categories and regenerate the frequency table. Also, you can report relative frequency using the proportion of students counted in each category compared to the number of all students, as well as cumulative frequency by adding up the proportion of each category. Another useful way to report frequency distribution is graphical displays. Bar graph is often used to describe the frequency distribution. Basically, you display the count on the y-axis and each category on the x-axis. On the left side, you will see the frequency histogram. Frequency histograms are basically bar graphs, but in this case, the categories might be ordinary and it makes sense to remove the space between the bars. On the right side, you see the frequency polygon. Frequency polygons are graphs in which the frequency of occurrence of the variables measured is shown by using connected points rather than bars. The data displayed in both figures are the same. Again, score is a continuous variable. So I started with getting the main and median of the variable. As you see here, the median was slightly lower than the mean score. Next, I analyzed the measures of dispersion by showing the range, which I calculated from the minimum and maximum. Also, I found the values for 25th and 75th percentile and calculated the interquartile range. On average, student science scores are about 10 points away from the mean score, which was about 50 out of 100. Finally, from the graph, as well as by the comparison between mean and median, we know that the distribution is slightly positive skewed. We can repeat the same thing for the math score. Because both science and math scores are on the same scale, we can compare the features of the two scores. We know that the average math score is slightly higher than the science score. Also, the standard deviation of math score was smaller than the science score, indicating that students have much variation in their achievement in science than mathematics. In terms of parental involvement, about 16% of students reported that they never discussed about going to college with their parents while about 43% and 41% of the students reported that they talked about college going with their parents sometimes or often respectively. You see that I presented this information both in frequency table and a bar graph. So far, what we wanted to know was the trend in one variable. Now, what if we were interested in knowing the relationships between two variables? In that case, you will employ bivariate statistics. There are three types of statistics depending on the nature of the variables that you are examining the relationship. First, if you are looking at the relationship between a categorical and another categorical variable, you will use a cross-tabulation. Meanwhile, if you will summarize a continuous variable via a categorical variable, you will employ a mean comparison. When you look at the association between two continuous variables, you will estimate the correlation of those variables. We will go over each of these with examples. Let's say the research question is to see if students who discuss with parents about college going are more likely to attend any post-secondary education institutions. In this case, we are looking at the relationship between the variable discussing college going with parents 
which is a categorical variable, and another variable attending at a post-secondary institution, which is a binary categorical variable. So we will create a cross tab that indicates how many students who never, sometimes, or often discuss college going with parents will enroll or not enroll in a college or a university. We see that about 32% of students who never discuss with their parents attended a college, while 27 and 30% of students who sometimes or often discussed attended a college, respectively. Therefore, we might conclude that there is not much difference in college enrollment for students with different level of discussion with parents or vice versa. Now, what if we want to know if students who talk to their parents about college going have a higher math scores? In this case, we are looking at the relationship between a categorical variable, discussing with parents, and a continuous variable, math scores. Basically, we get the mean and standard deviation of the math score among the students who answered never, sometimes, and often, respectively. At the end of the day, we see that students who discuss going college with parents often tend to have a higher math score than students who never or only sometimes discuss about it with their parents. Also, we can say that students who have a higher math score tend to discuss college going with their parents often than never. When you want to estimate the relationship between the two continuous variables, you will need to report the correlation between them. Correlation between the variables will be captured by the correlation coefficient, which often is presented as R. Zero correlation coefficient means there is no relationship between the two variables. One is a perfect relationship, meaning that as one variable changes by one unit, the other variable will also change by one unit. If the coefficient has a minus sign, that signifies that there is a negative relationship between the variables. This means that if one variable increases, the other variable will observe a decrease. Correlation coefficient will take values between minus 1 and 1. While there is no clear cut point for judging the strength of the correlation, coefficient that is smaller than the absolute value of 0.35 presents a weak correlation, while that of 0.75 is a strong correlation. Values between the two values represent a moderate correlation. Let's look at an example. If I wanted to know if there is an association between socioeconomic status and a student's test score, then I will estimate the correlation coefficient for the two variables. As you see here, the correlation coefficient was 0.47. So this indicates that there is a moderate correlation between socioeconomic status and students' math scores. Also, the graph shows that as socioeconomic status gets higher, math scores tend to be higher. Also, as math score increase, students' socioeconomic status seem to be higher as well. Hopefully, now you have a good sense of what univariate and bivariate analysis are and how you can use them according to your research question. To this end, I will provide you an example from a research study. The study I'm using here is available via Blackboard in the Supplemental Resources folder. Velasco's et al. 2014 investigated the question of to what extent have graduate students at different degree levels and different graduate programs borrowed using the National Post-Secondary Student Aid Survey 2008. The question was to understand the trend in variables on graduate students borrowing. First, the variable was the proportion of students who borrowed any amount versus who did not borrow at all. Thus, this presents the proportion of the frequency of students who falls into the category of borrowed for all students and for students who are from different degree types and programs. Second, for the amount that students borrowed, the author summarized the mean value because the variable takes continuous values. 
One thing that could have been offered is the standard deviation of the depth amount variable, so we can better understand the dispersion of this variable. Meanwhile, a group of researchers questioned the relationships between texting, academic performance measured by GPA, and anxiety and satisfaction with life. The researchers collected data from students in a number of courses at a university in the Midwest. Because they wanted to understand the relationship between texting and academic performance, anxiety, and satisfaction with life, respectively, they analyzed the correlation between these factors. What would you be able to conclude from the results? What would you be able to conclude from the results? Apparently, there is a negative correlation between texting and GPA and between texting and satisfaction with life. On the other hand, there is a positive correlation between texting and anxiety. However, the size of the correlation coefficients are pretty small because they are close to zero. So the conclusion can be that as students text more, students' GPA and satisfaction with life tend to decrease and anxiety level tends to increase, but to a very small degree. Any study that employs a quantitative research design would start from summarizing the sample data on key variables. In your case, the analysis would be likely to focus on descriptive statistics, particularly univariate and bivariate analysis, but remember that the choice of the analysis should be guided by your research questions. Once you understand your sample, the next step in a quantitative research would be to see if you can generalize your findings to your population. This requires inferential statistics that we will cover in the next lecture. I want to finish the presentation with the note that all of these analyses are done by statistical software and you do not have to calculate anything by hand. While there is a various statistical software, more general programs such as Microsoft Excel also provides pretty useful tools to conduct simple statistical analysis. In fact, there will be a workshop for you in the Applied Project course to actually learn how to use those tools. So until then, just keep working on your research design considering what statistical analysis you might need to conduct.